In this example, we're going to continue practicing MATLAB fundamentals with some built-in functions. A hooky in spring obeys Hooke's law. If you stretch a hooky in spring, the spring force that is produced is proportional to the spring constant k, which is a material property. You might have seen this in your physics class. The elastic potential energy stored in a stretched spring is given by this equation. We have the f and x values of six different springs, and we want to find various things related to their k and u values. Part A wants us to make the f and x vectors contained in this table in MATLAB. Simple enough. I divided each element in the x vector by 100 just so I don't have to type in the decimals in every entry. It's part lazy, part efficient. In part b, we need to compute each spring's k and u. To find each k, we need to divide f by x. Because our data is stored in vectors, we need to use the dot operator to signify element-wise division. This line says we divide each f by the corresponding x value. Note that k has one row and six columns, just like f and x. We'll use element-wise exponentiation for the potential energy. First, we have the x dot squared to square corresponding elements within the x vector. Then, we have to dot multiply with the k vector because we are multiplying each element of the k vector with the corresponding entry in the x dot squared vector. If you omit either dot, you'll end up with an error because you'll be telling MATLAB to multiply or exponentiate matrices with incompatible inner dimensions. We do not need a dot divide because this too is just a scalar. You can include the dot divide if you want, but you'll get the same output. I'm deliberately not adding the dot divide to specify which operations do and do not need the dot operator. It's always good to check yourself after every step, no matter the simplicity of your code. If you use a hand calculator, you can quickly confirm that each element in the k vector is in fact the f value divided by the corresponding x value. We can also quickly check that each u value is correct. Pause the video if you want to check every element. I highly recommend doing this frequently, especially as we begin writing more complex codes. Although it can be pretty slow, it certainly pays off once you find an error and is much less stressful than racking your brain trying to debug a 100 line code. In part C, we need to identify the springs with the minimum and maximum u values via the two built-in functions min and max. Even if a function sounds self-explanatory, I always like to read the documentation because you never know what you're going to find. Obviously, the min function returns the minimum element of whatever input you give it. But this only solves half the problem because we also need to find which spring has the min and max u in addition to what the min and max values actually are. If we continue reading the documentation, we can see that we can call the function with a second output. The second output i returns the index corresponding to the minimum value. The max function has the same thing. The i value is what we want for this part, so let's code it. The documentation labels the first output m and the second output as i, but I decided to rename them just to be more descriptive. You're allowed to do this because these are just variables, so they can be named whatever you want as long as they adhere to the variable naming rules. Finally, part D wants us to print the results from part C to the command window via fprintf. In each line, we want to print which spring has the min or max potential energy and its value. Here, I have the percent %d, which is fprintf's delimiter for printing a whole number. Then, I have the percent %f, 
which tells MATLAB to print the potential energy to two decimals. After we close the character vector, we have the umin location and the umin variables in this order because it matches the order in which we set the conversion characters within the string. If we flip umin location and umin, the code will still run, but we'll get the wrong output. Finally, I have the backslash ends to make a new line. This is just for formatting purposes. When we run the code, we can see that we've obtained what appears to be the correct output in the command window. We can double click on the u variable in the workspace. Upon manual inspection, we can see that the fourth spring does in fact have the lowest potential energy at 1.82 joules, and the second spring has the highest potential energy at about 3.83 joules. Solving the problem with the min and max functions affords us flexible code. If the f or x vectors change, the code will automatically update itself and still print the correct results. But if we hard-coded things like the number 4 or any of the u values, the fprintf statements will stay static and may not reflect changes to any of the other variables. You should avoid hard-coding whenever possible and leverage MATLAB's expansive library of built-in functions to help you write clean, flexible, and efficient code. See you next time.